Um, this is an interview with Paul Hackett of Urbana, Illinois, um, on September 12th, 2007, in the WILL studio, Campbell Hall, on the campus of the University of Illinois, Urbana, Illinois. Uh, interviewer is Kathleen Ricker of Champaign, Illinois. <clears throat> and uh, Mr. Hackett, um, so you want to start out by uh, telling us a little bit about um, how you ended up in the Navy in the first place? Well, I was born in Jersey City, New Jersey on March 30th, 1923. My family moved several places because my dad was a World War I veteran who had a disability. And we ended up in South Ozone Park, which is in Queens County, which uh, a part of the city of New York. I was in the class of 1941 at Bishop Rockland Memorial High School in Brooklyn. Upon graduation, I was working as an office boy for a company called Turl Iron and Car Company at 82 Beaver Street in New York City. On December 7th, a group of my friends and I had been to a movie, and when we got home, my dad told me that the Japanese had attacked Pearl Harbor. Well, I was, nine, I was 19 at the time. Uh, I continued working, and then in the fall of uh, 42, Congress changed the draft age from 21 to 18. And after having heard my dad's stories about The situation he encountered in France in 17 and 18, I decided I didn't want to go in the Army, so I went down and enlisted. Well, as I said, they had changed the draft age to 18, and I was 19, I wanted to go in the Navy. I had to take my father down and have him sign for me. Now, I could get drafted, but I couldn't enlist without for parental permission. So that was in December of 1942, and I believe it was January 8th, 43, I was called up. We marched from downtown uh, New York City to Penn Station, and we took a train and ended up at Great Lakes the following evening about 9 o'clock. We uh, entered a huge drill hall. We were giving bedding and taken to a barracks. And that, uh, what, that was on a Saturday night. We had Sunday to ourselves. Monday morning, we went through for a physical. Now, even though many, all of us had taken a physical before we were sworn in downtown New York, about 20% of the men who had traveled all the way to Great Lakes were uh, found uh, physically unacceptable to the Navy and was sent home. I, as I say, I arrived in Great Lakes around the 9th of January 1943, and I left there the last week of March of 1943, never having seen the ground. I have never seen so much snow in my life as I saw in Illinois in that year. Upon <clears throat> returning to Great Lakes after a 10-day le leave, I was sent to the Naval Training Storekeeper School at Toledo, Ohio. I was there from the middle of April of 1943 until the first week in August of 1943. <clears throat> at that time, I was 20 years old. Every Saturday that I had been, in storekeeper school, I had gone into Paco's. Now, Paco's is the uh, tavern that uh, Kling had talked about on MASH. Mm. The last week I was went in, I had my ticket to go back to New York, and uh, they asked me for my identification, and when they found out I was only 20, they wouldn't serve me, <laughs> even though I had been served for the previous six or seven weeks. Well, having uh, achieved uh, a score in the upper quarter of the class, I was uh, 
given a rating of storekeeper third class. So after being in the Navy, um, something like eight months, I went from $50 a month to $76 a month. From there, I was given another 10-day leave, and upon completion of that leave, I, I had to report to the Philadelphia Navy Yard in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, um, Pennsylvania, right. And uh, we were there, I don't remember exactly how long. Then the storekeepers were shipped down to Norfolk Navy Yard at Portsmouth, Virginia to uh, store, prepare the basic stores for the USS Mindanao ARG-3. Uh, on November the 6, 1943, we went, we were aboard the Mindanao at uh, uh, Baltimore, Maryland, where it became a commissioned ship of the United States Navy. Uh, we had this short uh, shakedown cruise uh, out on um, Chesapeake Bay, and on the 22nd of uh, December 1943, we left the United States. We uh, traveled by ourselves to Guantanamo Bay when we joined a small uh, convoy and we sailed through the Panama Canal. We left uh, the west end of the Panama Canal January 1st, 1944 and sailed to uh, Numea, New Caledonia, arriving there on January the 22nd, I believe is the date. We were there about a month, then went up to Espirito Santos in the New Hebrides. And we were there until around the uh, uh, end of September of 1944. We were preparing to go to Lady when the uh, army had secured that island, uh, that part of Yes, the island of Leyte. Uh On November the 10th, 1944, we were at anchor. It was a Friday morning, it was a beautiful day, and uh, it, we were getting ready for the weekly captain's inspection of the ship. At approximately 8.50, there was a terrible explosion. I thought we had been torpedoed. Then... Uh, I, I was uh, in charge of the sheet metal shop, uh, not the sheet metal, the, uh, uh, the uh, steel storeroom, and I was at the bottom of the ship, and from re from the concussion of the explosion, various uh, doors from the shops above and a uh, uh, whole cover of deck boards came down into my shop. Mm. And I was a little bit uh, upset and started using some language. <laughs> <laughs> uh, then, then we all tried to get out, and we got up on the deck, and the oil from the Mount Hood, which had exploded, filled the air, and it was black. So we went back down and ran through the mess hall and came out the other. By that time, most of it had settled, and the sun had come back out. Well, it took us uh, somewhere, oh, about three, three or four weeks to get the ship back in condition to operate as it had been before the explosion. Now, the Mount Hood is a 14,000-ton uh, cargo ship, which was uh, taken and assumed by the Navy sometime around July 1st of 44. And it was carrying somewhere in the neighborhood of 4,000 tons of various explosive ammunition. Mm -hmm. And when the dust covered, the ship had dis completely disintegrated. And the only the pieces they found out of it, the largest was a 10 by 16 sheet of steel. Oh, my goodness. There was 300 and some men on board that ship who died instantly. Uh, it was 27 on my ship died. And uh, uh, I think the total casualties, death, uh, injured and deaths, 
on my ship was 180. Oh, well, we were there from to, uh, January of 45, and we went back down the Solomon Islands to Russell Island. We stayed there for two months and came back up to Manus, and from Manus we went up to Ulithi, which was in the Carolyn Islands, and I left the ship on January 15, 1945, and got back to the United States on August the, I believe it was the 5th. It was the day of the first atomic bombing of uh, Japan. I had another leave of 10 days, and I uh, was sent up to Farragut, Idaho. Uh, I had uh, applied for V-12 training back in the early part of 1945, and I was notified that I would be leaving the ship on the J July 15th to go to uh, a university, which was not specified at the time. Uh, we went to Farragut, we were there oh, uh, till sometime in early September, and then I was assigned to the University of Missouri V-12 program, and I was there until June of 1946, and at the end of the school year, we were discharged, and we were sent back to New York to uh, a naval separation center on Long Island, and I was discharged, uh, I believe it was June, June 7th or 8th of 1945. And the only... Um, uh, I, I didn't see any combat because I was on uh, a uh, repair ship and we always stayed in the backwaters. Mm -hmm. And uh, the only reason I called you about this, I, I want to talk a little bit about this incident where this ammunition ship blew up mm -hmm. because I think approximately 400 men died that morning. Yeah, And it wasn't due to... Um, enemy action, and because nobody survived, oh, the words of working party had gone ashore shortly after 8 o'clock the morning of November 10th from the Mount Hood, and they're the only survivors. And actually, I found out later on, <coughs> excuse me, that the supply officer of the Mount Hood was a friend of my supply officer, and they were both on board the Mindanao, and they both got killed. Oh, dear. No. So it was kind of erotic to, to escape one ship and get killed on the other. So. But that's about the extent of my naval experience. Okay. Um, I might ask you, if you don't mind, some questions about uh, you know, what it was like to be serving. Um, so you said you went to storekeeper school. Right. What did that entail? When you, we, you went to storekeeper school, what was that like? What did you have well, to learn? Well, you know, it was a, a regular school, but mm -hmm. we did have uh, uh, physical ed programs. When we had to go parade every sa every Saturday, and we had to stand guard at the uh, the guard shack at the entry to the school. It was great duty. <laughs> we had a lot of fun. Uh, <laughs> We didn't know what was in store for us, but mm -hmm. so we had a great time. I had a great time in Toledo, and then they sent us to Norfolk. That was a little different. Uh, one night, four of us went out over to to Norfolk, and we sat down. We're having a beer, and the first beer was a quarter. So the second beer, it was thirty cents. The third one was 35 cents, but they said then we ran out of beer. <laughs> so but, uh, then uh, I, my naval career on this ship was very, uh, well, it was good duty. Uh, and uh, we, as we say, we were anchored there at Espirito Santos in New Hebrides. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were more or less of a tender for a bunch of... Uh, 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 minesweepers and patrol craft, and uh, also there was uh, CBs and, and Marines and uh, 
Australians on on the shore there, and one day we had a couple of hundred of them come over for dinner, and our ship's uh, enlisted uh, complement was about 400, and we served almost twice that many meals, so the next day we had to have a pass to get into the uh, mess hall. But uh, as far as the, uh, I've seen some of these ships that were involved in actual combat come in, like uh, this uh, aircraft Franklin that lost uh, 700 and some men, and we saw that before it left, hauled anchor, and there was a, a destroyer, a, a Oakwood, I believe, and it came in, and the whole bridge and the first funnel were all blown away. It was hit by a kamikaze. Yeah. And there were several ships that I, I just don't remember more about them, but uh, I'm, I'm sure glad I wasn't on them when these incidents occurred. Yeah. You see, off Okinawa, they say they lost about 5,000 sailors. Coincidentally, the... The other interview I did was actually with a gentleman who was serving aboard the USS Franklin. He was down uh, um, nine floors below deck when the explosion hit, and that was, he said that was a, a terrible, terrible mm. um, Is he experience. the fellow who's over the banner? Yes, Robert Hamm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, as I say, we got into Ulysses sometime on the 27th, I think, of uh, March, and uh, looking at the and through uh, binoculars, you could see what a terrible shape the Franklin was in. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, they pulled up anchor and they let go with what they call the hom homeward bound pennant. Now, a homeward bound pennant is one foot long for every member who was a mem original members of the crew when the ship was commissioned. And there was a Light cruiser, I think it was the Santa Fe. It was the one that came alongside the Franklin and assisted in trying to put the fires out. Mm -hmm. And they went back to Brooklyn for repairs. <coughs> so, you you actually really enjoyed your your training experience, and um, so what what does a storekeeper do aboard a ship? Well, actually, it's the uh, supply uh, division of the ship. Okay. And uh, there was various functions. One was in payroll. Uh, I was uh, I was in charge of a pipe fitting storeroom. Mm -hmm. You had to account for everyone that went out and what department was going to, and keep those records. Then I. Uh, I became the outside storekeeper. I t that was I would run the working parties off the ship when we go to various supply depots or to uh, uh, refer um, store ships and get uh, replenishment for my ship. And then I end up in the office uh, and taking care of uh, all the uh, requests for various by the various departments for various materials. Did you enjoy the work? It was very good. That's how I, I ended up going to School of Commerce here in Illinois. I graduated here in 49. Mm -hmm. So, so you, you did something like this after the war? Yes. What, what did you do after the war? Well, I worked at uh, Chinook Field for four years for the uh, Army Air Force Exchange Service, and, uh, and then I worked for a construction company here in town called C.A. Petrie and Sons. I worked there for 49, 29 years, and then I retired in, uh, let's see, 88. Okay. So, uh, did you get, you did get it to Espiritu Santo, so you got ashore yes. some time. What was that like? Well, actually, Espiritu Santo was the place where James Michener wrote the tales of the South Pacific. Oh, okay. 
he was a he was a naval officer there at that time, and he had a very um, imagined uh, imagination because he talked about this magical island with the big mountain on it. And when we went there, we'd go. It was flat as a pancake, <laughs> and uh, we'd go over. We'd take. Uh, we were allotted two cans of beer, so. We would take two cans of beer for every man going on the Liberty Party, and we'd take them to a place called Duffy's Tavern. Now, that at that time was a very famous radio program, and Duffy's Tavern was the centerpiece of it. And then we would trade our warm beer for cold beer. So, uh, James, so the, the island itself was very different from... Very, very book. different. And all the women you saw on the island looked like Bloody Mary. <laughs> In what way? Physically. Bloody Mary had the... Have you seen the movie? Oh, uh, no, I'm afraid not. Oh. Was <laughs> well, you see, they chew beetle nuts. Oh, 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 oh. And they turn their teeth uh, orange and black. Oh, dear. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, um... The rest of the book, though, I mean, I, I take it you've you've read Tales of the South Pacific. Well, I, I don't, it, didn't read the book, but I saw okay. the movie a couple of times. Oh, okay. Was it? But they did like? have uh, big uh, French-operated uh, uh, coconut plantations there on the island, mm -hmm. and they had a little Catholic church. We'd go over there, and wouldn't get off and go to mass over there, and um, what else was it? Oh, they had. Uh, several big supply depots on that. And, well, when you pull in there, if you went in at night, you think you were coming into a big city because it's all br uh, brilliant, brilliantly lit. And then the next morning when there's, <laughs> there's no lights, you find out there's about 50 different uh, Quonset huts. And each one was, uh, well, it's the unit of supply depot. <coughs> I know I went over there, there were one, they had nothing but uh, shoes. I had to get a pair of um, uh, field boots. Mm -hmm. So, uh, do you feel comfortable talking in a little bit more detail about the attack? Or, I'm sorry, about the um, explosion? It was uh, Well, uh, as I say, uh, we were getting ready for in inspection, and uh, I had a desk. It was under the, well, it was be op beyond the opening of the uh, hole. If it hadn't been, I, I, I could have possibly gotten killed because all this debris that came down there. Mm -hmm. And then we went up and... Uh, this, the deck was lit, lit it with uh, unexploded uh, ammunition and uh, actually some body parts. Oh, dear. So, uh, as I say, uh, I, I've got a picture in there. I've got a picture of the Mindanao after the explosion, and I've indicated where I was when this event occurred. So... Uh, uh, Actually, some of the guys were kind of surprised to see that I had survived because they knew of the condition and, and the, where I was at at the time it happened. And there was two fellows named Doherty, and they said, this one got killed. Well, I'm walking down the passageway, and here he comes. It was the other one that had gotten killed. Oh, dear. And the, that was kind of... You see somebody you think was dead, and you know, that, and it, uh, it was something you don't forget. Yeah. I mean, it, it really didn't involve me personally, but of the whole ship was involved, and uh, as I say, and I uh, keep thinking about it and don't like, uh, and. Uh, because uh, I lost several friends that day. Mm -hmm. and 
It was. It wasn't as bad as the Franklin, though. I'm telling you that. It, it still sounds very, very bad. <laughs> it's yeah. Um, you want to talk a little bit about some of the folks that you knew aboard the ship? Some of your friends. Well, you see, um, a lot of the fellows on this ship came from the New York area. See, I was living in Queens County at the time. And they had fellows come from New Jersey and Pennsylvania, and and but they were all different. Um, they were in different divisions than myself. So the supply division was division number eleven, mm -hmm. and they start out one and go on arm and up. Uh, uh, they've. I have a gotten a recent um, list of the men that. They've contacted regarding uh, reunions, and uh, I, as I say, I left that ship 62 years ago, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm just looking at it yesterday, and uh, I only remember about a half a dozen of the guys, and those were either been with me on working parties or were uh, in the storekeeper division with myself. But... Uh, uh, we seem to have a very uh, congenial group of men. And, uh, as far as I know, there was no uh, animosity or or any break out of uh, actual fisticuffs or anything like that. But uh, some of them got uh, out when they went out on uh, Liberty, and they got to two cans of beer, and in this hot sun, it uh, sort of... Uh, well, we had a couple of them come back drunk. <laughs> so, oh, dear. <laughs> but uh, there's a picture in there showing what Liberty and one of the islands was like. Uh, that was at Ulithi, and that was the last place I was before I came home. So, Do we actually have the... Uh, They're uh, scanning them. Oh, okay. Maybe when they come back from uh, scanning, then we could have a look at them. That's... So, um, when you were away, did you have much contact with your family? Not very much. Uh, my, my, I got, you know, just letters because, see, when I got back from the States, we were given 10 days to get to Farragut, Idaho. Well, at that time, it took five days by train to get across the country. So we couldn't do that. And uh, uh, see, I left home in December of 1943, and I didn't get home until Christmas vacation in 1945. And by that time, uh, uh, my one brother and one sister had gotten married. and. Uh, I was, I was, I was the second of nine children, and uh, uh, one, one of them died uh, oh, just after birth, and there are still six of us living. The oldest is uh, will be eighty six tomorrow, and I was eighty four in March. So, but. Uh, We were living there in New York, and one of my sisters married a sailor, and they moved to the West Coast. And my dad and mom, they retired. They decided to go to the West Coast and live. And uh, they were living in Vallejo, California, shortly after. Well, they moved when I was in college, and after graduating from college, I went out there and went to work for the Bank of America. But I was engaged to a girl here in Urbana, and so I came back to Urbana, and I've been here since. Hmm. We got married in 1949. Okay. Um, so you were um, you were still in the Pacific uh, when Japan actually surrendered when. Uh, no, 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 I'm no. sorry. No, I'd gotten sent to San Francisco. Okay. 
uh, I think it was either the 5th or 6th of August in 45. I was in Portland, Oregon the day. Oh, okay. That, uh, I'll tell you about that. that uh, we, as I said, we were on our way up to Farragut, Idaho, and we had a train from, well, I'll go, I'll go back a little bit further. We got to, when we got to San Francisco and I couldn't go home, this one fellow said, well, why don't you come to my place down at San uh, Pasadena? So six of us hitchhiked from San Francisco to Los Angeles, and his parents had a house that looked over, you went up the top of the hill and looked down, you went right in the Rose Bowl. Oh. And so then uh, we left to, to go from Los Angeles to go to Farragut, and we got to uh, Portland, and we had to change, train, had a layover train, and uh, we'd gone to the USO, and while we're there, a department, some representative of the department store came in looking for some male models because they were going to have a uh, fashion show. Well, they didn't want me. I was too tall. So they took one of these guys, he's about foot nine, five foot nine, five foot ten. And so we went to the fashion show, and in the middle of the fashion show, somebody came in and said, the war's over. Japan has surrendered. Everything closed up. You couldn't get a drink, you couldn't get a bite to eat. And we had to lay there until on the train, we, when the train, we got, some, got to be able to eat on the train going to Farragut. And then from Farragut, uh, as I say, we went to Columbia, Missouri, and I had a lot of good times in in uh, Columbia. And of course, I was going to school and getting some education, <laughs> but it was a lot of socialization, socializing in that time. Excuse me. And then, as I say, uh, we were there until. June of 46, and I got discharged. And that's about the extent of my naval experience. Okay. Now, I didn't know if you wanted to get that, but I thought I'd come over and talk to you. So, how's your view of your experience changed over the years? You say that you remember it. Um, now pretty distinctly, just particularly that day. Well, Is that you know, I've seen the way the change in the, uh, the students at the university, especially the way, the way they dress now. Mm -hmm. You know, on, on, if we had uh, a date, take a young lady out, She'd come out dressed. I mean, I'd go, I'd be wearing a suit and tie, and mm -hmm. and now you see a couple walking down the street, and they got ragged jeans and look like they went through the rag bag to get the clothes. <laughs> and, and then uh, there's been an awful lot of change in the social mores of the country. I mean, since the war, I guess. Yeah. You know, yeah, and society is, I think the, the moral standards have gone down considerably. Actually, I, I was, perhaps I should um, ask the question a little bit differently. Remembering what you do about your time in the Pacific during the war, has that changed any over the years? Has the way you remember it now changed well this one years. particular incident is still very clear to me mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if I'd want to be in the service now or not because uh, uh, you know during the war and we we most of us enlisted because we didn't want to get drafted Mm -hmm. And that way, you got a choice of what you wanted to do. Uh, now, uh, again, it's back to being a 
voluntary decision on your part if you want to go back to service. But what I was going to say is the men we worked with who were maybe five, six, seven years older than we are, they had joined the Navy during the Depression because it assured them of a place to live, uh, medical assistance at three meals a day, mm -hmm. and I think they got $21 a month as, a, as an apprentice seaman. Now, when I went in, we got $50 a month as apprentice seaman. Wow. So, uh, uh, well, I'm trying to say that they had their ideas about how the Navy should be run, and of course, we were all what they call feather merchants because we were came from different backgrounds and, and we were adapting to the uh, Navy routine. And uh, some were kind of uh, rather envious because. Uh, there were guys who had been working in defense plants and making an awful lot of money at that time before they went in the service. And these guys who went in the service, and now they had time, so much time in the service that towards the retirement, they couldn't do anything but to continue on as being in the Navy. And But uh, it wasn't too much. It, it, some of it existed, but it wasn't something you couldn't live with. So feather merchant, that's not a term I've heard used before. What is a what what did you mean by that? Or what does it mean, feather merchant? They don't consider you actual uh, naval personnel. I oh. mean they, you you didn't go through what they went through. I see. And you came in and uh well uh a lot of that term was also used for these young officers who come out of college and got a degree, got a, a commission, and uh, they weren't, uh, oh, it's, they weren't fully ingrained as naval personnel. Mm -hmm. and they were put in positions of command and they had to work, uh, well, uh, I was watching PT-109 the other night and I think it was in there they used that f terminology referring to an office as being a feather merchant. So, so sort of a lightweight. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, a, it's yeah. A, not, a, not a, a term of endearment. Mm -hmm. Do feather merchants ever get credibility? Do they gain respect over time? Well, you know, at one time... Uh, if you hadn't gone to the Naval Academy, regardless how long you've been in the Navy, there was a certain, I mean an officer, say an officer went to the NROTC here at, the Illinois, at Illinois. Uh, I think the highest rank you could attain was captain. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that's changed now because uh, uh, They've had so much in man for uh, so many for more officers than uh, they can graduate at Annapolis each year. So, but uh, it was wartime, and we had to make do with what we had. <laughs> so, but a lot of people, people, men gave up a lot of of uh, well business practices, lawyers, and doctors, and and uh, to go serve that country. Mm -hmm. and, and myself, uh, I had no intention of going to college. I didn't have the money to go to college, but uh, by going to the Navy, I got four years, uh, and I got a degree in management from the university. So this was on the GI Bill? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think we were getting $65 a month when it started Back in forty five, forty six, I see now to get a thousand dollars a month. So, the situation is a little bit different. Yeah, <laughs> of course, everything costs a lot more now too. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah. Okay. Um, I guess one last question, and that would be, has your view of war in general changed over the years? Has your view of, the, of war and what it means to serve changed over the years or as a result of your experience in the war? Well, I don't think war answers questions. Okay. All it does is create a lot of chaos. I mean, in addition to the destruction of buildings and the men who die and women who die in their service, look at the people who are displaced. Look where they have to go. They don't know what they're going to do. And as I say, it's uh, the only thing is, though, uh, some people or some countries take advantage of the fact that other countries do not want to get involved. And it's like like uh, back in 1939, when Neville Chamberlain said uh, he had a raid, had an agreement from Hitler. And it didn't last maybe three or four months before he decided, and that's why World War II started. Mm -hmm. But uh, I still think it's, uh, it's such a waste of men, material, and money. Uh, you see, uh, all the ships they built during World War II, and most of them were only used in late 43 to 45, and then they take them out and they store them for 15 or 16 years, and then they scrap them. And you wonder why they tend to do that. Is there anything else you'd like to talk about or say? No, I don't think so. I think we've covered everything that I could tell you about okay. what, what I did. So. All right. Let's see, we have our pictures back yet? Doesn't look like it. Let's go. I, I was in my attorney's office, and I have another hat, and it said U.S. Navy on it, and. Uh, his son asked me what ship I was on, and I told him. So a couple of days later, in the mail, he sent me all this information about the ship. And actually, I didn't realize how badly damaged the ship was because I, I never looked at the si on the side of it. See, the ship was anchored, and the left, which is the port side, was facing the ship that blew up. Mm -hmm. And consequently, we took the maximum, uh, um, well, see, the ship exploded in little pieces, and it was like little uh, flying bombs, and they punched holes in the side of our ship. And uh, I didn't realize how bad it was until he sent me this. And then I got myself a computer, and I went in, and there's a... Uh, web page and has the history and pictures of 7,000 different naval ships. And that's when I found out a lot of, I went and I looked up my ship and got the information on it. And then I uh, looked up and got history and pictures of the ship that blew up. Now, the USS Mindanao was a, a Liberty ship, and it was built as the Elbert Hubbard. And I, for years, tried to figure out, find out who Elbert Hubbard was. And I even act, asked a librarian at the university, and they couldn't tell me. Well, he died on the Lusitania. Oh. And he wrote something called A Message to Garcia. I don't know what that is, but apparently that was his claim to fame. And so it was renamed the Mindanao. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I, I don't know whether they must have taken fifteen or sixteen of the Liberty ships and made. See, our ship was. Uh, it had various shops. We had a. A diesel engine shop. We had a sheet metal, uh, uh, and a 
ship uh, fitter shop. We had a carpenter shop, an electrical shop. And uh, one thing I do remember, I don't, it's not important, but uh, I was walking through the electrical shop one day and they had this great big armature there. And they were rewinding it. And I started talking to the electrician I know and he says, well, this belongs to one of the French planters over on the island. And uh, it had burned out and they had to rebuild it for him. And see, this tells you where I was in the Navy. Okay. Can you hold it? Well, let me give you the other side first. Okay. What's that piece of paper going over there? Tell me about that. This is my honorable discharge from the Navy for service from uh, 1843 to... Uh, six seven forty six, and then it's on the back of it. It shows you the places and ships that I was served on, and uh, down here it shows you what medals were awarded. So, all right. Is there anything else I can do for you? I think that's probably all the questions I have.